Welcome to the DNA Talks podcast, where we take on the mission of unlocking the code of your genetics. This season is all about you, upgrading your health, not just on the surface, but down to the root cause. Join us as your clinicians at the DNA company investigate your DNA and beyond. The intention of this podcast is to enhance your lifestyle by changing what is in your control. This does not substitute the medical advice given by your personal doctor, therapist, and other healthcare professionals. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we are going to focus on your gut. There's been a lot of questions about this topic that come up when we're talking about other topics because everyone says, I am bloated and my gut hurts. So why is this so prolific and why does everyone have a problem? I'm going to start by telling you a story of one of our patients, which really helps paint a picture of how multifactorial and connected the gut actually is. And understanding gut health and improving it and how foundational that is to overall health. So there's a patient we were dealing with, back in our research phase, we were actually working with McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, and there was a researcher there that was studying the gut microbiome. Brilliant, brilliant guy, looking at it functionally the same way that the DNA company would look at genetics functionally, meaning not this bacteria means this, this bacteria means that, but how does this grouping of bacteria plus somebody's environment, nutrition, lifestyle, equal the disease that they're experiencing. So there was a lady that was being studied who had fibromyalgia and she had it ongoing. And this is a consistent problem nowadays where you have these PCOS, endometriosis, fibromyalgia diagnoses that just linger and there doesn't seem to be a solution. Endometriosis, women are told that you have to get surgery. You know, the PCOS is something you just live with. And same thing with fibromyalgia, this pain that just sticks around. What that really tells us is that there's something underlying that's a trigger that isn't being addressed because you weren't born with PCOS, endometriosis, and fibromyalgia, you develop them. And as we treat the symptom, we don't ask the question, what caused it? So in this particular lady who was part of this research study, she was asked to stop eating any sugar, any starch, any carbs whatsoever, and went on to somewhat of a carnivore diet. And the thinking was that We're going to adjust her gut and see what happens to her disease. And as expected, based on the theory, the disease went away. So how are these two things related? So what we found and what the theory of the scientist was, is that based on her diet previous to the adjustment, she was eating a lot of sugars and carbs and starches. And as these food enter your gut system, you have to understand that there's a third party, a visitor, a guest that was never invited your gut microbiome flora, a variety of bacteria that live in your gut. In fact, there's more gut bacteria DNA in your body than there is human DNA. That's how much of a village you have in your gut. And when you're eating certain foods, you're fueling the bacteria that eat those foods. So it's not just you benefiting from the nutrition entering your gut. There's bacteria that are waiting for you to eat to get the food that it needs. And now, Keep in mind, for how many thousands of years, I can tell you, hundreds of thousands, that, can, uh, that you know, whether you're Canadian, American, whether you're, you know, European, African, we all kind of came from the same root habits. Agriculture is only 10,000 years old. Previous to that, it was all hunter-gatherer, kill an animal, eat a plant. So our guts... And our microbiome are adjusted to that, thinking that that's still what's going to be happening. Now, if you start fueling with unusual imbalances in food, like too much sugar, like too much starch, too much carb, you're going to end up like this lady, where the wrong gut microbiome flora, the wrong bacteria was being fed and flourishing. And then all of a sudden, that gut microbiome bacteria overpowered and became the dominant force in her gut. And guess what that bacteria does after it finishes eating? Just like you and me, it poops. It has to excrement the waste of the food that it just ate. And being that the poop of that particular strain that eats that particular food that we are not supposed to eat in those volumes is toxic, and you're constantly eating those foods, in this lady's case, it led to this massive inflammatory response. So this disease, which maybe was accurately described is fibromyalgia. The symptoms all seemed like it. And I could understand why they called it that was literally a result of inflammation 
from toxic poop from feeding the wrong strain of gut microbiome bacteria. The solution wasn't to solve the fibromyalgia. It was to eat the right foods so that the wrong bacteria would die because it's not being fed and the right bacteria would thrive and survive. You wouldn't think that, uh, you know, it's something that is so, so complex that lingers is so easy, but it is. And this is what happened. So this is why when we get into questions like fasting, you know, if I'm fasting, is my gut microbiome going to be disturbed? Because there's an obvious question, well, the good bacteria isn't being fed either. You know, and, and some people are actually not fast for that reason. But the fasting is what allows that bacteria to die off the bad stuff. And the good bacteria is used to hunger, starvation of our ancestors. It actually will start to become robust in those conditions while the bad bacteria dies off. So fasting is a rapid way to adjust. And if you're doing a multiple day fast, a lot of us will intermittent fast. But if you're doing a 36, 72 hour or even longer, you know, whether it's a water fast, a tea fast or something that keeps you going, uh, you'll see a massive reset of the gut because the good microbiome will start to flourish. The bad will die off. And all of a sudden, the byproduct of that flora is good health. So why is it important to manage our gut? There's one reason we just talked about, which is you could be making yourself sick by having the wrong flora populated, but there's also the actual function of the gut that goes beyond just digesting food as the simplicity that we speak about it as. It's not just, here's where my food goes. 80% of your immune system is housed in your gut. So if you're compromised there, which so many of us are, then do not expect to have an efficient operating immune system. Expect that it's going to be somewhat dysregulated and not responding properly. Why is this important? Obvious reasons. It's not just about cold and flu season. There's a direct correlation between gut health and cancers. Why is this? We all have cancer all the time. It's not something that we, that we develop. And it's not that I have breast cancer, I have pancreatic cancer. It's no, my body has cancer cells and my immune system is constantly getting rid of them. Now, in combination of my genetics, how do I make hormones? How do I clear toxins? What quality hardware do I have from breast tissue to brain tissue to pancreatic tissue? Plus my immune system, you have this triangulation of why or not you would have a disease. And so in ignoring your gut, you are also ignoring the key system that your body is relying on to keep you cancer free. Really important. And for those of you that are fighting it or have seen it in your family, again, top down thinking, you have cancer, let's fight the cancer. Did we ask the question about the root? Did we ask the question about why did this happen? So it's important to consider that ignoring your gut is ignoring your immune system and ignoring your immune system is deciding that it's okay for disease to set in. It's okay to be sick two or three times a year. The measure of health isn't how often you get sick, but how quickly you recover. Getting sick is exposure. That's your kids going to school, bringing something home. It's going to happen. You get the tingle in your throat. You get a little bit of a stuffy nose. What does it turn into? Is it gone in 48 hours? Or does it turn into something that puts you into bed for the next week? That's the measure of health. And that's a clear signal of what your immune system is doing. And the fix to what it's doing is supporting your gut. We're going to get into that a little bit, but a second thing that's happening at the gut level that we don't think about because it seems so far away is your brain. The neurochemicals like serotonin, dopamine in large numbers are made in your gut. I believe somewhere around 70% of your serotonin, about half of your dopamine is made in your gut. Again, if you have dysfunctionality at the gut level, the neurochemicals you need to balance your mood, not have anxiety, not get depressed and feel satisfied with all that's happening aren't being produced efficiently. And it doesn't matter what pill you take or what supplement you take, that's all a mask. The engine, the factory that makes this stuff that you need so much to feel the way you need to feel and manage your environment and your relationships is, is broken. And you need the factory operating first. That comes back to gut health. That's why we say that there's this gut brain connection, by the way, there's this very uh, clear gut brain connection. And it's not just in the meta, you know, it's also quite physical, meaning a lot of us are walking around with what we call leaky gut. So leaky gut is when you 
have abused your gut to the degree, and in today's reality, this is not hard to do. A lot of people thinking that their gut has not been abused don't know the reality. What What's really happening is the foods you're eating, the stresses you're experiencing, the load on your immune system are chipping away at the lining of the gut wall. So here's your gut, here's your stomach. The interior of that gets exposed to everything that goes in it and the wrong exposures can slowly damage the gut wall. And eventually you get this permeability, leaks, little tiny holes, micro holes. And that permeability equals what we call leaky gut. So why does this matter? A few things. Firstly, if your gut is leaking, what's happening with the nutrition that you think you're getting? I can tell you that as a previous victim of my own choices, having leaky gut, I did a live micro blood cell analysis. What does that mean? It means that I drew my blood, put it on a Petri dish, and examined it under a microscope live. And what did I find? Proteins. Proteins don't exist in the blood. They get digested. And when I posted this and shared it with the group, the scientists said that you're wrong. It's not possible because proteins don't do that. The, the, the meat that you eat gets digested in the gut tract and you don't see it in the blood. And I said, okay, you're thinking academically with borders. You're thinking like this, that it only happens this way. Is there another possibility that that protein never actually went through the gut tract and leaked from my stomach, not fully broken down directly into my bloodstream? And the eyes opened up and the jaws dropped and they said, yes, that is highly possible. And this is what we call leaky gut. I had it. I no longer have it. When this is happening, a couple outcomes. You're not getting the nutrients you think you are. And second, there's certain toxic substrates that come from your food, especially in today's reality, the, the pesticides, packaging, plastics, and so on, that as they pass through your permeable gut wall, directly into your bloodstream, instead of bypassing through your gut tract, can now cross the blood-brain barrier. So you have a gut barrier, a gut wall, they've gone through there. You have a blood brain barrier that's designed to protect your brain from certain toxins to keep your brain young and healthy. But it wasn't designed with the understanding that some things don't get broken down and some things in their whole form enter your bloodstream. And so these things are now able to pass the blood brain barrier. And this is why we say there's a direct connection between the gut and the brain. If the gut is not healthy, all of a sudden the brain is receiving the wrong signals and the wrong physical input of food that wasn't broken down and toxins that weren't broken down that can lead to cognitive decline, dementia, starting with things like brain fog, memory issues, over time equals something much worse. Another very important reason why you have to pay attention to your gut and fix it. Now, why is it that in the same environment there's different outcomes? Why is there one person in the household has leaky gut and not everybody? They're eating the same foods for the most part. They have the same lifestyle. When we look at the genetics of the gut, we find that there are some really jaw-dropping aha moments in terms of the exposures that are so prolific, meaning that very common. There's a gene called GSTM1. If I were to look at my report, I can tell you that I don't even have it. It's missing from my genetic code. This gene is a primary detoxifier of the gut, or at least instructs that function. This gene will tell your body, hey, you're eating some food. There's some toxins that came along with your food. Let's get rid of those. Let's make sure they don't cause horror to the system. Let's break it down, send it to the liver, pee and poop it out, get rid of it. Now, if you're missing that gene, which it's possible, it's not possible for most genes to be missing them. There's versions or variants of them that you could have. This gene is possible to entirely not even have it. It's called a copy number variation. If you're missing the gene and you don't have that first line of defense, and then you're in today's reality where food is toxic in nature, you're going to have a gut problem. And this is what happened to me. Migraines, eczema, psoriasis. Why did I have those problems? They didn't just happen. They were caused. When you have suboptimal gut health and you have leaky gut, and you have no detox of the gut and toxic substrates that you would think are okay are not getting cleared, major inflammation head to toe. And you end up like me with five chronic conditions, blaming the conditions and treating them as separate siloed problems, as opposed to understanding that they're all the same thing. This is your body expressing the inflammation that 
came from an open door of leaky gut and no gut detoxification. Now, the opposite is also true in today's reality. Remember, to understand health, you have to understand it in the context you're in. So in today's reality, you have food that is more toxic than it's ever been, especially post-1970s. And some people have the really good GSTM1 gene, really good and efficient gut detox. Given that your body thinks that you're a cave person, our body doesn't know that we've been through an industrial revolution and things have changed. It really thinks you're being born to live in a cave and eat fresh as possible. Now, if you take that really efficient gut detox, two copies of GSTM1, mom and dad both gave you the gene, and you put it in today's reality where there's a constant drip of toxic food entering your gut, the response is that your body is so good at detoxifying, it triggers an autoimmune response. It triggers your body fighting itself because it's so good at fighting, but you're also so good at causing the fight because of what you're eating. And this leads, we've seen, to autoimmunity. And now all of a sudden, not understanding what's going on in your gut can lead to the difference between I feel okay to I have crazy inflammation and I don't get why to I have crazy autoimmune symptoms and I don't get why. I'm doing everything right. This is where people get stuck. I'm doing everything right. Why do I feel wrong? two glaringly obvious reasons. And so this is a unique scenario where it's actually the middle ground, the not so good version of the gene, not the best, not the worst, which is ideal for today's reality, which is I don't overdo the detox, but I still have a bit of a system there to handle things. Now, if I manage to balance my food, I'm going to feel okay. So good and bad aren't true when it comes to contextual thinking when it comes to genetics. It's what tool do you actually need to deal with your reality? And in this case, it's the middle ground. The other layer to digestion is enzyme activity. And we find that there's certain people that will go onto a vegan diet, for example, and they feel good in the first couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden they get sluggish, you know, four weeks in, six weeks in, they have brain fog, hormones aren't balanced properly. And it's difficult to blame the diet because you felt so good in the first two weeks. And it means so much to you. What we find is that in order to be a successful vegan, you need to get your proteins from beans, lentils, chickpeas, legumes, which means that you need to be able to break those foods down and efficiently utilize the nutrients they deliver. And if you have a suboptimal methylation gene that is supposed to do the job of breaking those foods down, well, you're not going to do so well. And this is the case with so many people. And by the way, when we look at unhealthy people, the people that need help and support, there's more people in the bucket of, I don't do the enzyme activity that well versus I, I do it well and I should be a vegan. So the majority of people we see would not thrive on a purely vegan diet. When you do know this, I would say there's a couple options. One is to stop eating the food or second is to add the enzymes that your body doesn't innately make. So if you start to add again, knowing what the hole is, here's the gap. This gene isn't doing so well. I don't make these enzymes. I need to add some. Or this gene isn't doing so well. I don't make the enzymes. I can't eat this food. Two decisions to make based on why you made the decision in the first place, right? Now, all of a sudden, the gut isn't struggling with an additional load. You're dealing with the toxins, but you're also dealing with the struggle every time you eat because the enzymes aren't there. But the same is true of other diets, whether you're a carnivore, or whether you're low carb, high carb, in order to be a successful keto diet or carnivore, you have to be able to actually efficiently use fat as fuel. And we understand genetically that some people don't. And same old story, which is first two weeks, ketosis feel incredible. Brain is on fire, using fat as fuel, your belly is melting away, everything is good. Then all of a sudden, brain fog. Then all of a sudden, lethargy and low energy. All of a sudden, my mood is off. What happened? Well, if you don't do a good job of turning the food you ate into the fuel you need, eventually it will catch up. And so in order to maintain your gut and give yourself what you need, you really have to understand genetically what your body is doing, right? What are, what is the instruction when you make a choice, when you either eat something, expose yourself to something, smell something, breathe something, what does your body instruct to do with that choice? And it's clear in your genetic code. We know this information. And knowing that would sort of arm you with what choices to make and then always feel good. So how do we support the gut? 
Well, we've heard about probiotics, prebiotics. What are all these things? A basic thing that can be done is to add fibers. Your gut microbacteria loves having healthy fibers. And if I start with two, two of the better known, there's lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. And if you look up either of these, you're going to see a ton of information telling you how good you're going to feel. We've actually seen research where these bacteria deplete as you age organically, naturally. And there's a direct correlation between the age of them depleting and people gaining weight. And think about the 15-year-old kid. Doesn't matter if he eats an entire chocolate cake or decides to be a lean green salad eater, their body type is likely the same. Yes, some kids, if they're eating things like, for example, high fructose corn syrup, which is creating you know, the liver to create more fats, that's a different story. But can, thinking that the assumption is the food is somewhat clean um, and it's not driven by high fructose corn syrup, that all of a sudden, you know, why is this kid able to hold the weight off that an adult can't? Their gut microbiome has not been disrupted yet. And they maintain higher levels of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, two of the key proponents of burning fat. And we've seen research on people adding these bacterias and fiber strains through things like inulin and the foods that you get them from. And all of a sudden, the body composition changes, the muscle fat ratio. So maintaining your gut health and having the right, right, right microbiome bacteria is not just about disease. It's not just about leaky gut. It's also about things like, how do I look? And this is why when you go back and look at pictures of people from the 1920s versus the 2020s, it looks different. Yes, there's other factors like the food itself. Yes, there's other factors like environmental toxins and stress. But the food itself, when you make that statement, what is the food doing that causes you to change the way you look and feel? One of the key areas that is affected is your gut. The wrong flora is fed, the right flora is not being fed, and all of a sudden there's an imbalance and you have a ecosystem that is not aligned to longitudinal health, to good weight levels, to good mood, to good brain health, to not having things like fibromyalgia, and these things become prolific. So I would recommend to anyone that's listening, understand your gut. There's things you can do to test. In fact, my understanding is the DNA company just launched a gut microbiome test. It is the other half of personalization. One half is to understand your DNA. Here's how I'm wired. The other half is to understand your gut microbiome. Here's what's going on today. And if you have those two tools in hand, you know what choices to make. You know how you're going to feel. You know how to make yourself feel the way you want to feel because you know what's driving the alternative. So having your gut microbiome tested, I would say is step one in knowing, you know, what to do, what to action and how to add in the other half of personalization to your health regimen and feel good. The next step is to action what is found in your report. It's to understand, okay, here's the imbalances. Clearly, I'm eating too much of this and too little of this. Clearly, I need to add this. Clearly, I need more of this bacteria versus less of this. Here's why I have candida versus I don't. You know, you start to understand a whole other layer of work that needs to be done to reach your health goals. And if you do these two things, which is understand your genetic code to know all of the other things you need to work on, plus understand your bacteria code in your gut to know all of what you need to work on, there are very few stones left to unturn. If you look at most genetic researchers and most gut microbiome researchers, they will both tell you the same thing. We've now figured out the root cause of disease. They'll both say the same thing. In fact, there's a well-known gut microbiome testing company whose slogan is, disease is now a choice. They're both saying the same thing and they're both right. Now imagine putting both of those tools to work because both have answers, but they don't either have all of the answers. But when you put these two together, there's very little left to know. And so, so much as my personal time has been spent in genomics and understanding the human instruction manual, and I found that I was able to resolve my issues, my family's issues, and our clients' issues through that avenue, I acknowledge that there's another layer, which is the gut. And if 
all of what you heard today opens your eyes to how impactful gut health is to overall health, you'll also understand that there's work to be done. And the work to be done is to understand what's going on in your gut. And second, to then take action by testing and understanding. And third, to then take the results of the test and know exactly what action you need to take. Supplementation, foods, you know, disease reversal, age reversal. It's another source of aging if you're not doing this right. Mood improvement. What are all the things you need to do and what are the outcomes you're going to receive? And like myself, unknowingly, I didn't purposely say, I'm going to fix my gut to fix my health. But after finding out leaky gut was there, by my genetic code driving me to look at my gut because I had weak gut genetics, I did fix my gut. And I cannot talk about my age reversal and chronic disease reversal without giving a thumbs up to the work I did on my gut. Primary, primary role and why I feel better today. So with all that, get to work. If you haven't already done so, take a look because it's another path to how you're going to feel better and how you're going to prevent some of what you don't want to see in the future. But all in all, take care of your gut. It's central to longitudinal health. It's central to personalization. And we now know so much more, so it's so much easier to do.